Hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time and sitting down with me. Maybe, uh, maybe tell us kind of what's your background and what you've been doing lately for those who don't know you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, yeah, in terms of background, you know, originally from San Diego, California, uh, went to the Naval Academy for college, uh, uh, spent six years in the Navy in supply and logistics. Um, I didn't know I'd end up in, you know, logistics, real estate, but it, it, it all works out. Um, after the Navy, I, I ended up going and get my MBA at UC Irvine. Uh, so that's how I ended up in Orange County. And that was 2007 to 2009. And then if you recall, 2009, Great Recession. <laughs> so uh, really, really tough job market, similar to kind of how it is now to, to some extent. Um, but I, I was fortunate enough to find an opportunity in uh, brokerage. So I worked uh, tenant rep brokerage in Orange County doing office tenant rep with JLL uh, for almost two years before uh, I found an opportunity with uh, Panatoni Development in 2011. So I was there, uh, Panatoni Development in Southern California from uh, 2011, really up until 20, January 22, um, when I opened the the uh, first SoCal office for Scannell Properties um, uh, back in uh, January 22, as I mentioned. So, you know, Scannell has offices all over the U.S. and, and Europe, and this was a uh, first uh, physical office here. We've done about two and a half million square feet of industrial uh, projects out here, um, mostly built to suit, or really all built to suit, because uh, that's really the Scannell's what what we're known for. But um, over the years, starting in 2012, really started to get into spec development work, and and that's really the reason to to open up the SoCal office was to to get into more off market spec development opportunities mm -hmm. out here, while also searching for for build to suits and and uh, and staying true to our, our roots, so to speak. Interesting. Okay. So yeah. you, you've got quite a breadth of background there. Let's, let's uh, hone in on SoCal real quick. So SoCal, sure. obviously one of the largest, if not, it probably is the largest by square footage market in the entire country. You have the ports of LA and Long Beach, huge, you know, very busy ports. Everyone knows about it. You've got over a billion square feet there. What, Give us a quick overview. I mean, what what is the SoCal industrial mark market like right now? How what what are the challenges you're facing as a developer? How are you? What are you doing? How do you be successful in SoCal as a developer? Yeah, no, that, that's that's a, a lot to 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 answer. Yeah, easy um, question, but, right? Yeah, yeah, because it, you know, <laughs> it's yeah, but I'll I'll do my best here. But uh, uh, yeah, you know, SoCal, as you mentioned, you know, we we have the ports of LA and Long Beach. You know, in terms of industrial base from San Diego to all the way up north to, to Ventura County, um, just north of LA, it's totaling about 2 billion square feet. Um, and in that area, we have uh, roughly 24 million people in Southern California. So just alone, Southern California is a, a huge market in and of itself. So you combine that with the two largest ports by volume, um, and with what's happening with e-commerce um, and that growth as, as it continues to gain market share over traditional brick and mortar, uh, you know, retailers, um, you know, that all those things combined really make, you know, Southern California very attractive for, for the long term. But, but obviously, like, like many markets across the country for industrial, uh, we're facing significant challenges uh, at the moment. You know, obviously, you know, you go back to March of 22 when the Fed started to see that, you know, inflation was was getting out of control and it wasn't uh, transitory as they first initially thought mm -hmm. back in July 21 was the the the, the famous uh, words that they they uh, they said at, at the time. You know, so uh, what the Fed was starting to do was to really, um, you know, push the the Fed funds rate and. It went on to increase the the Fed funds rate over a, a short period of time, very quickly and very very steeply, um, and that obviously had an effect on the capital markets and um, really did its job in terms of slowing things down and um, slowing business investment and slowing the ability for for folks to to, to lend. Um, so that greatly affected our our industry. We started to see. You know, the 10-year the treasuries start to tick up. 
we started to see, you know, cap rates start to expand, um, you know, kind of as a, as a result of that as well. Um, so it made it really difficult on the capital market side to, to kind of transact. Um, and we've also seen as the effects of higher interest rates, if, if tenants and, and the businesses, you know, if they can't, um, if, if they can't, uh, you know, get the financing they need to invest in their business, you know, that stuff starts to come down. And they're, they're also noticing that because of the higher inflation, you know, consumers maybe aren't spending as much as they once did because their dollar isn't going as far. So with reduced consumer spending, that reduces tenant demand. And then the, the businesses that are occupying these warehouses, you know, if they're, there's less consumer spending, you know, and they kind of see, uh, I think every expert out there predicted a recession to hit in 2023. So, you know, you see all that, you see all those the, the news and you see what's happening to your business with effective interest rates and inflation, you know, maybe you start to pull back and you say, hey, maybe we don't need that that extra 100,000 square feet this year. Let's wait and see kind of what, what happens. And so that was what, in my view, I think 2023 was, you know, kind of just wait and see. Tenants were uh, hesitant to commit to anything long-term. You know, you saw, you know, you see renewals happen and you see kind of short-term deals. You see a lot of sublease space hit the market. Um, so the, the, the deal velocity went down considerably, you know, um, in the last year. So, you know, although I mentioned that the overall economy is not in a recession, I think commercial real estate, for all those reasons I just mentioned, we're in a recession. And we have been really since, you know, I think maybe third, fourth quarter, 22, when, you know, the uh, interest rates really started to get out of control. The, uh, you know, the 10 year treasuries were, were ticking up uh, north of 4%. So that, that spooked a lot of people and had to, you know, a lot of people were reevaluating kind of their underwriting criteria at that time and, and still continue to do that. So, with with all of that happening, it's like, you know, there's with with the leasing velocity down, you know, this tenant demand overall is down, you know, because you know consumer spending has slowed, you know, you, you start to see, you know, some downward pressure on on rents. Um, so supply is still, you know, being delivered to the market, but then if there's not tenants, you know, filling those now vacant buildings, now we have a, a supply problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, with more supply, you see the the downward pressure on, on rent. So with with the downward pressure on rents, now as a as a developer, what rents are we using if we're going to be honest with ourselves to to justify a purchase price for land if if rents are falling? It's it's hard to to peg where that where that could be, because I think, as I mentioned, with with more supply, there there still could be some further downward pressure on rents. So you know we're solving to to higher yields now to mm -hmm. to account for all the the risk now with development. Um, and another thing that um, that we're doing is you know we're we're taking more of a risk off mentality, whereas before you would close on land unentitled as long as it was zoned industrial. And you could close, you know, do 45 days due diligence and close in 15 days to 60 days and then boom, you close. Um, now, you know, it's more of a mentality where you say, OK, we have to wait until we're uh, entitled at, at the very least and um, even better permit ready. And so you mentioned the difficulties for doing deals out here in Southern California. That timeline here, depending on the size of the site, could take. 18 months, you know, longer, you know, for, for larger sites that have, you know, if you have to do an EIR, that could take two years plus. And then on top of that, you have construction drawings. So, you know, that's another uh, six, eight, 10 months sometimes, depending on the, the, the jurisdiction that you're dealing with. So, um, yeah, these are long timelines. So by the time you say, hey, let's do a deal today at this rate, you know, three years from now, it could be totally different when you start construction. And then, you know, another year when you finish construction, 
you know, a lot can change in that in that time frame. So that, that's why you know development has always been very risky, um, and you know it's it's more so uh, pronounced uh, in, in a in a challenging market. You know, when when the market was hot, you know you could it, you know like I said, forty five days DD. 15 to close, you close, you get the thing entitled, you build it, lease it, sell it, boom, on to the next one. And you're just kind of doing it like a machine. And and tenants were, you know, they couldn't get enough of Southern California uh, industrial. You couldn't build it fast. Enough. Mm -hmm. And so now it's, we're starting to see some of that really change, you know, so we, we saw it go up really fast. Um, and now we're also kind of seeing the, the back end. I mean, th that real estate development and real estate is a cyclical business, right? So um, for, for a long time, really from 2011 to, to 2022, right? Like it was a, a nice long, long run up. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's good. And un unprecedented, you know? Yep. So um, that was further, um, you know, fueled by what happened in 2020 with the pandemic and everyone, you know, getting sent home and got money, uh, pumped into the system, you know, sure, you're, you're going to have inflation, right? And it's not transitory. Yep. Yeah. So. Well, you, you, uh, you hit the nail on the head on a lot of things there. A couple, a couple thoughts for you. One, remind me to send you, I have an awesome meme with Jerome Powell and talking about transitory inflation that'll oh, yeah. make you giggle. <laughs> I've got a good one there. Two, <laughs> you mentioned about the predictions of a 23 recession. I was looking back today uh, eight of the larger banks out there back in December of 22, six out of the eight predicted that we'd be in a recession in 23. Right. And then here we are yeah. today and six out of eight were wrong, which to yeah. me just further signifies that everyone tries to have these crystal ball predictions and thinks they know what they're talking about, but no one right. really knows what's going to happen. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Okay. So let, let's drill down on a couple things you were talking about. What you're describing in Southern California is very similar. I, I think of Seattle as kind of a sister market to California, Right. Um, or maybe the little brother would be a, maybe a better way to, to phrase it. We have two major ports. Mm -hmm. We're land constrained like you guys are. We have a huge population base. Um, so there's a lot in our, our development and entitlement process is also very difficult, right? Right. I think what most people who aren't intimately involved in real estate development don't quite understand you you look at development and it's like wow look at you know there's there's so much tenant demand and amazon is filling every building and wow those guys are making money hand over fist this is great i need to get into it and building spec there's no risk right i mean it seems yeah. <laughs> it seems so rosy from the outside and yeah. then you drill down on it and you realize what the process looks like how much time it takes how difficult dealing with various municipalities and getting permits and approvals can be mm -hmm. and then the huge uncertainty of that the time you go into starting a project when you start really committing big dollars to yeah. the time that you're stabilizing or, or whatever your your investment strategy is right i mean you're talking 12 18 24 if not you know three to five years right depending on right. the project how are you able, if six out of eight banks can't properly predict a rece mm -hmm. recession over a span of 12 months, you have to, I mean, you're, you're, you're making some very educated guesses on what you feel the market's going to be doing by the time your project is completion. Right. To your point, if you look at our run up from 11 to 22, we were on this awesome streak of just every year was theoretically better than the last Right. So you you would predict your your future in two to three years, and then usually the future ended up being better than even what you predicted. So everybody was doing really well, right? Yeah, everyone Fast forward was smart. To, everyone was smart, right? <laughs> even the guys that didn't look smart at the time ended up being smart later. Yeah. And then fast forward today, and it feels almost the opposite, that you have to be right. an uber conservative in what you're predicting for the future because everything feels more uncertain than ever. So I, I bring all that up just as a roundabout way of delving into how challenging this process can be. Mm -hmm. But let's talk quickly specifics. I know, so like Seattle, we, we, we refer to ourselves as land constrained because we have water to the west, mm -hmm. we have mountains to the east, and then Canada border to the north and, and Oregon border to the south. So really all we can do for the most part is go north-south. We have a shortage of industrial zone land. I mean, these are all themes that you run into um, but I would argue that still the majority of our development is greenfield development because we don't, and, and for those who don't know, greenfield would mean developing a site that is previously undeveloped, doesn't have any kind of buildings or, or structures on it. 
versus mm -hmm. brownfield being call it an existing building that gets torn down and, and redeveloped right you're from what i understand of southern california as much as there are greenfield developments out in the you know call it secondary markets if you think core socal i mean most most of your developments at this point i imagine are brownfield in some way shape or form which is still which is very interesting to me because we have some of those here in seattle but the our I shouldn't say issue, but the reality of our our dynamic here is that land values and just our overall you know industrial market sub economy hasn't really values haven't supported a lot of brownfield development. We just haven't gotten there yet. Whereas mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are that that's kind of your norm, unless I'm right. mistaken, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's kind of it's it's definitely the norm. I mean, you know, that's why you look at you know between the three biggest markets in, in Southern California, you know, LA is the biggest with a billion square feet. Orange County is about 260 million square feet. Inland Empire is about 660 million square feet. Um, you know, Orange County and LA are very mature, well-established, you know, so if you're building there, it's likely a tear down. And, and so even with all that develop, you know, all that developed land, you know, 1.26 billion square feet combined between LA and Orange County, there's not that much that gets under construction. So LA is typically anywhere from six to 8 million, maybe nine to 10 million under construction in any given year. And, and, and that's when, you know, more recent past, right? When, when construction was, was booming. Um, and Orange County is, you know, kind of the one to 3 million under construction. You know, so there's not a lot given the size of that market, mm -hmm. right? But when you look to the Inland Empire, you know, there's, you know, 30 to, to 40 million under construction in any given year. So all that's coming down right now because, you know, uh, for the reasons I mentioned before with yep. uh, lack of ability to get construction financing at the terms people want, changing market dynamics, you know, construction starts are definitely slowing um, in 24 and and likely pushing into 25, there's not going to be that many new construction starts. But, you know, I think, you know, the the Inland Empire is, has, has, because there's so much under construction, they're delivering so much product each year. And now when that, that, that spigot gets shut off in terms of tenant demand, now you really have a, a supply issue, right? So, you know, I ran a survey a couple of weeks ago, um, in the Inland Empire between 100 and 250, um, you know, 100,000, 100, 250,000 size buildings. So there are 134 options in that size range, Oof. which includes subleases and, you know, other stuff. So, so I mean, but if you actually had a tenant requirement, like for 100,000 square feet, you're not going to look at 250, but, you know, it's right. going to be a much right. tighter window. And then, but, but still the, the point being is that, in that size range, there's there's a considerable amount of, of options for tenants now, whereas, you know, a few years ago, Inland Empire was arguably the hottest market, not just in the country, but in the world for industrial. Uh, the uh, the vacancy rate got down to 0.1% in, in, uh, in 2021, and, and it was hovering around, you know, less than half a percent. For, for a good portion of 21 and, and into early part of 22. So, you know, it's it was pretty staggering. Now that that uh, that vacancy is ticked up to, to north of five. Yeah, um, wow. it's probably still ticking up um, until this tenant demand uh, returns. So um, it's hard to say when that will happen. You know, if, you know, all these people were calling for, you know, some sort of recession in 23, you know, is that going to happen in 24? You know, probably the same folks are that said it was going to happen in 23 are now saying it's going to happen in 24 at some level, but there's others that say it's not right. It's, it's going to be more of a soft landing. So um, we shall see how that plays out, but it, it creates more uncertainty, especially for a tenant perspective where you say, well, if there's going to be a recession, then let's kind of kick the can down the road, not commit to anything long-term and let's just, um, you know, uh, do a short-term deal or, or just renew or, you know, but, but talks of expansion um, for tenants, I think at least in the, the near term for 24, probably you, you might not hear a lot of those types of conversations. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think you're, uh, have options. 
Yeah, I, I'm I'm seeing the same thing here in my neck of the woods. Um, you made a comment earlier and kind of alluded to that we're not really in a greater macroeconomic recession, but that we're kind of in a commercial real estate recession. And I, I quasi agree with you there. Um, the the interest rate environment, I mean, it, it basically took us from, you know, running on rocket fuel to now everyone's like, whoa, whoa, we're back to reality, right? How do we figure this yeah. out? I've been kind of referring to it, and I don't think I'm the uh, the, the originator of this phrase by any means, but I, I feel like we're going through, rather than call it the Great Recession, the Great Reset, right? Mm -hmm. um, land values, property mm -hmm. values, you name it, cap rates, uh, everything got pressed to its absolute max because cheap money was cheap. Money was cheap. It was widely yeah. available. Rents were going up. The economy was on fire. I mean, every lever that you could pull to make things great for a commercial real estate and specifically an industrial real estate environment. I mean, basically every lever was was pulled to the max, yeah. right? Which made everything just, I don't want to say easy, but kind of easy there yeah. for a minute, right? And then flip that interest rate switch, availability of money becoming drier, money being twice as expensive, if not more, is what it used. I mean, it just, it it put such a huge damper on this, you know, rocket ride that we were all riding on. Albeit, you'd probably agree with me that, you know, a 5% market still very tight and very healthy. Rental rates, while there's downward compression on them, they're not exactly falling off the cliff, right? And in a lot of core markets, they're, they're holding or are, at least in my world, still increasing a little bit. Um, so I don't really think it's all doom and gloom, but what I do think is going to happen and you're, you're, I'm sure you're experiencing this is my kind of general thesis right now on industrial development is that once those interest rates started rising and everyone got more conservative on figuring out how to entitle land and you couldn't pay as much for land as you could, right? No, no land really for the most part feels like it's getting entitled right now and really hasn't been for most of 22, pretty much all of 23 for the most part. Like Seattle, for example, I mean, we've been delivering a healthy plus or minus 10 million feet a year in our pipeline. Mm -hmm. And 24 has a lot of carryover product that was already in the pipeline. 25, we'll see a little bit. But when I look ahead to 25 and especially to 26, I don't know where the product's going to, I don't know if we're going to have any product to deliver, right? right? Yeah. And so while vacancy has been ticking up steadily, more options, we have the same thing if you're talking about in that size range, we've seen a massive uptick in options. I'm of the general opinion assuming that the general course kind of gets corrected in the greater economy, inflation continues to go down, interest rates, you know, maybe go down a couple blips um, over the next 12 to 24 months, we get past the presidential election. It seems like there's all these factors that are, you know, maybe cautiously, I'm optimistic, are pushing us back into a, a really, you know, call it robust economic environment. So what happens then? Demand is going to pick up from tenants because their businesses are doing well. Consumers are spending more again. And they're going to go, we need to occupy new buildings. Well, great. Guess what? There aren't any new buildings that are coming out of the ground for you to occupy anymore. So it's going to put a yeah. huge downward pressure back on the vacancy rate, which is then going to put pressure on rents going up, right? And property values going up because there's going to be, I mean, basic supply and demand, right? Supply will right. go down. And if, if demand's going up and supply is going down at the same time, I mean, we're going to, I don't want to say we're going to have a problem, but it's going to be, it's going to be a challenging environment. That's for sure. Especially for tenants. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's definitely the, the, the hope and, and kind of how that, that plays out. So yep. yeah, yep. I'd love to have that happen. <laughs> That'd be great. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm, right. I'm with you there uh, to a degree. We'll <laughs> figure out how to navigate it. So, so let's, right. let's finish with this. Maybe what are you and more specific to you, you know, Scannell as a developer and your guys' model, you mentioned that you guys have, have historically been great at doing build the suits specifically. What's without, you know, divulging all your secrets, what's kind of your plan for 24? What's the what's the company business plan as far as what you're trying to accomplish and, and how do you think you're going to be successful doing development this calendar year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as as doom and gloom as as I, I painted earlier, I mean I, I still think you know, there's going to be opportunities, you know, in, in any market, it's just, how can you find them? So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we, we, you know, we've already seen land prices come down considerably from, from where they were, you know, in, in Orange County market alone, you know, there were four land transactions that, that just went down all in December. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there haven't been really any land transactions, you know, for most of 23 and then, you know, had four in, at the end of the year. So, 
um, you know, I, I think there's there's going to be some opportunities. It, it's just more of how can you get in front of the right sellers. Um, you're you're essentially trying to find a, a needle in the haystack because you know before you know you could name any price with rent growth, cheap debt, available equity. Um, you could make almost any deal work. You know, rent growth was was astronomical at, at one point. You know, first quarter, or I think it was second quarter 21, the second quarter 22 in the Inland Empire West submarket, rent growth was 98.6%. So, you know, you don't model that in, into your, your, your pro forma, but, you know, anything less than that, you would have looked like a genius because, you know, it, uh, almost 100% rent growth. So, um, you know, you could make a lot of deals work, but obviously we don't have those factors anymore. So now we've adjusted, right? So we've adjusted our, our underwriting criteria and now it's more finding that seller who actually has a, a need to sell, you know, the death, divorce, taxes, retirement, you know, uh, loan maturity coming up that they, they need to face some uh, major decisions. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the types of sellers that, that, that we're having to, to find and search for. Um, so they're out there, you know, that someone has to sell. So it's just, you know, it, it's just a matter of, um, working harder, working more smarter, and trying to, to, to locate these these groups. Um, and then, you know, we, we love to buy off market. You know, that's that's kind of the, the name of the game. You know, we, we buy yeah. off market and, and sell on market. So, you know, that, that's that's how we, we do it. You know, I think, you know, for, from a build suit standpoint, you know, that's, that's always been in our DNA. You know, at Scanel, you know, I think uh, roughly we're 50% built suit and 50% spec. So, you know, I think those opportunities will uh, present themselves at some point, you know, and, and we'll be ready. We'll have, you know, get in front of key sites and, and, and put, put together deals. So, yeah, I think 2024 will definitely be a, a challenging year. Um, but, you know, th that's, that's what it's all about, right? You know, to, it's supposed to be challenging. It's supposed to be hard. You know, that's what makes the uh, the good times that more um, uh, worthwhile and, and, and you appreciate things more when, when you do have to struggle, right? So, um, you know, no one wants to watch the movie of, of someone who just had it easy. You know, they, they want to see they want to see the, the movie where the, the hero, you know, get hits rock bottom and then somehow keeps getting up and, and, and makes it so. Um, yeah, there, there's going to be opportunities in any market. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, you know, looking forward to that, looking forward to 2024 and, and all the challenges that it brings. Yeah, I think what I took away from that is you got to be a little bit smarter. You got to be a little bit more creative and it's definitely harder than it used to be. I know we're all experiencing that right. firsthand. So good, <laughs> right. good points there. Well, uh, thank you for for all your insight um this is awesome we'll, we'll definitely yeah. have to schedule another time to chat more because i know we could talk until we're uh, blue in the oh, face yeah. but, yeah, but for those who <laughs> yeah right um so for those who but if anyone wants to get in touch with you who's working the socal market has ideas for you wants to pick your brain on on your expertise i mean what, what's the best way to usually get in touch with you yeah sure thing uh thanks for asking that i, I think linkedin um is is probably the the easiest way and then we we can take it from there um, so I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn and um, search for, for my name and I'm the only J Tan one in there. So it'd be easy <laughs> I to can't, find. I can't say the same about me. There's too many maps <laughs> out there. I'm, I'm a little hard to find sometimes. But, yeah. um, awesome. Well, thanks again All for right. joining, Jay. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll schedule a follow-up here sometime soon. Yeah, this is great, Matt. Really appreciate you having me. And uh, if you need me anytime, happy to happy to join you. All right. Good deal. Take care. All right.